Hello, everyone. <laughs> I actually miss having that venue echo that I know you're getting right now. And I'm imagining, but I know you all can hear me. I hope. Anyway, Michelle, are you there? I also hope. And hello to everyone that is joining us in the virtual venue. Uh, thank you all for joining us. Let's see, uh, Michelle. All right, Stone and Chalk can put, ah, yeah, there you go. Can put, ah, yeah, there you go. Yes. I could hear you that whole time, which is great. And I'm assuming you can hear me now. I can now, yes. I can now, yes. Um, we have about 15 people here at Stone and Chalk <gasps> in tonight to join, which is amazing. And Amazing. I'd love to go around the room Amazing. and see what everyone like is doing and why they came around to be here today. But that would be unfair to people on the chat, I guess. But if you're on the chat, you can let us know, you know where you're dialing in from. So there's about you know 15 of us in Adelaide. Woo. <laughs> Enthusiastic audience. I miss being in front of an audience. This is great. I was, was um, going to say, like, yeah, go yeah, yeah, um, totally yeah, yeah, um, well, totally miss it as well. And I love this echo for the um, but yeah, um, of, but yeah, it was in big round of the It was in Woo. Woo. We're getting some whoops. People don't remember there's how to clap. There's people clapping. That's fun. But yeah, hello from the past. We're dialing in half an hour behind you in Adelaide. So, what's it like in the future, developer Steve? Well, it's raining, so well, it's there's raining. that. So there's that. <laughs> <laughs> we had that this morning, so maybe you guys are in the past. But anyway, um, so let's let's go ahead, I guess. Oz IoT, Australia IoT Meetup. We used to be Melbourne IoT when developer Steve started this um, probably just over a year ago. Um, and then thanks, you know, to the online working, we thought we'd bring it virtually. At the time I was in Queensland, so that was great for me. And the other host, Develop Ali, was in Sydney. So it was great for us. And then we thought, you know, why not continue and expand this out to Oz IoT? So um, we're sort of just, for any of you guys here have been to an Oz IoT meetup before? Anyone on the chat or anyone in person? Great. All first timers here in the room? I've, I've been to a couple. <laughs> I've, I've been to a couple. <laughs> You've been to a couple. We've been to every single one. Um, <laughs> but we're here to bring together IoT enthusiasts and you can take that, you know, wherever you think it is. You could be an expert, you could be uh, just starting out or just interested in IoT and it could be any vertical um, of the internet of things or connectivity in general. Uh, we've had some pretty cool speakers in the past, like Binary Beer, who was talking about how they use IoT to track um, beer kegs and some other exciting stuff. Um, we had some uh, IoT guys from the Gold Coast who designed some smart locks, which are now actually in Bunnings. So how you go from having an idea to actually getting something on the shelf. Um, and they're actually all on our YouTube site if you want to dial in um, and see them like after tonight. Um, anything else, developer Steve, about Oz IoT that people should know about? Um, yeah, that is a good um, point because yeah, we are that is a good point a because now. we are literally Ooh, a year birthday. old now. Ooh, happy birthday! Happy birthday, Oz <laughs> IoT. Um, and before we go much further, we just want to acknowledge that those of us here in Adelaide, we're here on Ghana land. Um, and I want to pay my respects to the elders, past, present, and emerging in Adelaide, and recognise that sovereignty was never ceded, and um, extend that, that respect to where everyone else is dialing in from today. Um, I'm not sure where you are in Ballarat, but I know Melbourne, um, some of you guys are there in Melbourne for the Warren Jerry people. So extending that to everyone else and their lands. Uh, just to add to that too, yeah. Just um, to add to that too, really yeah. Um, I would love to pay my respects to the Wadawurrung people here in Ballarat. In Ballarat. So that's, you know, how cool is virtual life that developer Steve can be literally a global advocate and living in Ballarat. Love that. Um, so the run of events for tonight, this is the intro. Um, after that, we'll have uh, lovely Nicole and Steve from Miriota to be speaking to us about satellite IoT and actually doing a live demo. So wish them luck for that. Um, and then we have Jonathan Oxer, Oxer who will be talking about the ESP Flash Programming Header Convention. And I um, you know, alluded to the fact that this was a space-themed event. Jonathan might not be speaking about space tonight, but he has a bit of experience with satellite-y things too, which you can ask him about. Um, and then we're going to have some project sharing if you like. Usually what we would do is um, everyone can go off mute if they like and talk about something they've been working on um, and sort of pick the brains of the other IoT enthusiasts that are in the virtual room. Um, so if you guys have anything that you want to share, I can hand the mic over to you and you can share and ask, ask questions. Um, usually everyone's a bit shy, but we won't hold that against you. 
Um, and then we'll wrap up with some good old networking. So for those in person, we can have a chat, grab another drink. And for those online, you can actually jump between the different Remo tables. So we'll talk about Remo in a second and how that works just for the online audience, but you can actually do some pretty cool networking uh, there as well. And we're hoping to wrap up in about an uh, hour and 55 minutes. Um, so that should be enough time. Hey Michelle, before we get underway, hey, Michelle, just before we get underway, the just with you saying about the demos, I'm, I'm going to get all the demo fail. I'm going to get all the demo group. fail out in one go, and be like, and be like, fine, this is fine. Yeah. There we go. We've got the memes ready in case the demos don't work, but they're going to work, so it's fine. This is fun. Developer Steve, did you want to introduce us to Remo and the Remo platform? I did, but I might just put you on mute. I did, but I might just myself. put you on mute because I keep hearing myself. <laughs> um, or you can do it if you want. Um, or you can do it if you want. Turn it off my microphone, so I'll turn it off while you're talking. Okay, I think I'm still going to come through. Okay, I think I'm still going to come through the speakers. Yeah, I do. Okay, yeah, I do. Okay. Uh, uh, two right. sex. Wait, you, you need to see laptop. You, you need to see laptop. Mute the laptop. Yes. Oh no, I can mute you, but I can't. Oh no, I can you, mute so. you, but I can't unmute you. So. Hey, thank you. That's better. Now I I was hearing the th you know that thing where you hear, where you do a phone call sometimes and you hear yourself. Yeah, I was getting that. Anyway, it was throwing me off. Um, so welcome to the virtual venue. As you can, uh, for those in venue or for those that haven't seen it even for the first time, this is how we've been doing some of our a whole bunch of our virtual engagements over the last year. Um, so basically, these tables of up to eight people uh, can talk at the same time all through the magic of a browser. Um, they're able to put on audio, video, screen share all at once uh, and also can run uh, multiple chats. So it's a great place to be able to just geek out because you can you can literally jump around to any table you want, join a conversation, start a new one, et cetera. Tables do have whiteboards as well. So if you want to do a bit of a conceptual design, you can map stuff out. Um, and right now we're in presentation. Uh, you can't jump around tables until we go back to the floor and then you can jump around stuff. You can actually use the text chat for those online. Uh, put um, stuff into general chat so everyone can see it. Um, special, uh, I'm gonna say it's an Easter egg. Maybe it's a bug, maybe it's a feature. But um, you can actually use HTML tags in that as well. And you don't even have to close them. Yes, I too like to be lazy dev sometimes. Um, but yeah, you can just um, put the like a B tag or something and it will just bold it, et cetera. And fun fact, one of my all time favorite uh, tags does work, Marquee. Yes, Marquee is making a comeback evidently. Um, so again, you don't need to close it. You can just do a Marquee open and things start scrolling. So you can have a bit of fun with that. Um, what else was there to cover? I think that was all. Michelle, jump in if I have missed something, please. And don't forget you're on mute. <laughs> I'm back. I was just going to okay. give, uh, talk about the code okay. of conduct as well while you're here. Oh, yes. Um, oh, yes. So we do have a code um, of conduct. We do have coming into the URL or the virtual venue. Um, you're um, you basically familiar with or have read the code of conduct. It is on our GitHub. We are open to suggestions, comments, pull requests, all the things, uh, if there's any changes that you'd like to see, et cetera. But basically, essentially, just be nice to each other. But I know you all will because, I mean, we're one big open source family, one big open source community. So, um, you know, be respectful, be mindful, have fun, just be nice to each other, um, essentially. Is there a GIF on this? I vaguely remember there being a GIF on this slide. Is there a GIF? Oh, no, there isn't. Normally, I have my uh, Bill and Ted, um, oh, to quote the words of Bill and Ted, um, yeah, just be excellent to each other. <laughs> Actually, get you to run through the next couple of slides. We'll be talking about call for code and things like that as well. So you can jump oh, well, maybe is Ali here? Oh, is um, Dev Ali here? Yeah, is developer Ali here? Anyway. I am. Hello. <laughs> yeah. The host. Yeah, there she is. Special right. 
<laughs> uh, I'm loving this hybrid bread. You um, little few little teething problems there, but we're working it out. <laughs> it's pretty awesome. I'm so it's sorry. Totally for... <laughs> uh -oh. I love it. Um, and great to be having one last meet up with Steve. Although we'll continue with us OT. Um, so. Call for Code is IBM's Tech for Good um, hackathon. So it ran last year. We had over 500,000 submissions into the Call for Code hackathon last year, right. um, which was amazing. And one of the highlights was one of the teams from Australia actually came second globally in the world. They're now getting support to build out their solution. Um, and they also won... I don't know how much money they won actually, but I know the grand prize was 250,000 US dollars. So pretty cool incentive there, but that's not the main incentive. The main incentive is to, you know, bring your ideas about how to change the world, about how to be the change that you want to see in the world. Um, to call for code. You don't have to know how to code um, necessarily. Like it takes a diverse team. Um, it, the two guys that were, I came second, for example, were both business students um, and they then hired some developers. <laughs> Not hired, but uh, recruited into their team. Um, but you don't have to know how to code. Um, people from all backgrounds, and you're all IoT hobbyists, so um, I am sure you bring some amazing skills to this as well. I'd love to see some IoT solutions this year, actually. Um, so the themes for this year are, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, zero hunger, I believe, um, clean water, and what's the third one, Steve? Temporary mind block. Uh, I know you know. I actually have forgotten <laughs> as well because, of yeah, all the things. But um, okay. check out anyway, so. <laughs> yeah, definitely check out the website, developer.ibm.com slash call for code. I'll chuck that in the chat as well. Um, we'd really love to see you there. Like I said, especially um, IOTS, we're going to be doing kind of a global um, call for code hackathon in May. So that's the first time I've announced that. So you're hearing it here first. <laughs> um, and we're, yeah, we're going to have heaps of cool partners there and hopefully um, some more exciting things to announce coming up to that May one. So uh, keep an eye out, keep an eye on um, myself and tweet, uh, Steve's uh, socials. I know Steve, you're at SNCC now, but still hopefully going to call you in. Um, <laughs> so keep an eye on um, the socials and check out that um, website and start getting a team and an idea that can change the world together because we'd love to see you there. So um, I'll stop taking up all of the bandwidth. Amazing. Thank you, Ali. Um, totally worth checking out. Love that program. Thank you, Michelle. Um, and of course, we have, we've got some amazing sponsors tonight and we have a new one being added. You may have already guessed who that might be, but we'll get to that in a sec. But yeah, we have um, IBM Developer. This meetup is brought to you by uh, IBM Developer and uh, Telstra Dev, two of my absolute favorites. And yeah, no biases. But um, we do have a, uh, a new uh, sponsor coming in, in for the next meetup. Um, I'm going to switch scenes a little bit for this one because, yes, it, it's the company I'm going to work for, <laughs> Sneak. Um, but, yeah, we'll cover that one in another time. I'm not going to go into, go into that too much. But this uh, this scene is fun, so I thought it's worth showing. I'm going to switch back now. There we go. <laughs> um, I'm going to grab my screen on the other screen. Awesome. Michelle, did you have anything to add to that one? To that one? Yes, I do. Let me jump back out onto the stage. Um, good. Thank you guys for handling that. So the next thing I wanted to mention, I kept trying to mention it. That's fine. Um, we're doing a little competition tonight as well uh, to win an Arduino kit, including the Telstra Cat M1, uh, like LP WAN SIM, uh, and an environmental shield. So all you have to do is post on your socials with a tech pun. So I'm surprised that developer Steve hasn't made a dev joke already. <laughs> Uh, so we'll expect one of them later. Um, but if you guys have a tech-related pun, um, post one of those and you can win an Arduino kit by the end of the night. So the only thing is you have to be registered on dev.telsha.com as part of the T's and C's, but we can sort that out after after you win. We talked about Call for Code as an upcoming event. And now <laughs> we're going to go straight into the talks, I reckon. So we can jump across the um, to networking and the Remo tables um, afterwards. But seeing as we've got people in the room, we're ready to go with the talks, I think. Um, I'm going to introduce the guest for today. So the first one we've, we've first talk we've got tonight is from Muriota. So I'll welcome you guys to come up on stage. Yep. Give some claps. Let's do it. Thanks, Brooke. 
So we've got Mariota here. Um, Nicole is the Director of Product, and maybe I'll get you to introduce a little bit about yourself as part of the presentation. And we've got Steve, who's VP of Engineering. Um, two amazing people and we're so glad that we could be in person with you guys today. I'm so happy. I know you guys are excited to be in person for an event for once. I love it. Go Adelaide. Um, and we're going to be jumping into satellite IoT with Miriota and their developer kit. So put your hands up in the room and maybe in the chat you can post it as well. Um, if you know anything about satellite Internet of Things comms. Yeah, I've got a couple of like tentative hands, probably like half the room, tentative hands. Anyone in the chat knows a bit about satellite, let us know. Um, but we're going to be learning how to send a message into space tonight, which is where the live demo comes into play. Um, and you can learn more at miriota.com slash developers. But without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our people here. You need to click both of the things to change slides. Yep. And I'm going to hand over the mic to Nicole and Steve. Fun. All right. Yes, please. <laughs> uh, thank you for having us. We're very excited to be here. Everyone in the room and online, thank you very much. Um, if we click through to our first slide there. Um, yeah, we're here to talk about jumping into satellite IoT with Mariota, and that's us. We've also got a few other reps in the room. Um, we can go to the next one. So who are Steve and Nicole? That's us. So I'm Nicole, you might notice from my photo. Um, I am the director of product at Miriota, uh, which just means I get to um, talk to both the customers and the technical team to help formulate the product roadmap for the company and make sure that we're developing satellite IoT connectivity that people want to pay for, which is always a good thing. Um, you can see I've got a couple of pictures up there. One of those is um, one of my kids. They like to make my life extra hard, so we always get to include them in the pictures. And um, that's one of my hobbies, quilting. Um, it's a bit different from my day job, but that's, I guess, what a hobby is all about. And Steve? I'm the other Steve, not developer Steve, and uh, I'm VP of Engineering at Miriota. And uh, my hobbies outside of work are things like messing around in boats and walking the dog with the family. Cute. Cool. All right. Oh, you didn't mention your life-saving work. Yeah, that's messing around in boats. It's a, it's a bit better than that. <laughs> Just saving people on the beach. <laughs> All right. So next one. Okay, so who is Miriota? So Miriota was founded to um, revolutionize uh, the Internet of Things by offering disruptively low cost and low power um, global connectivity. So we're based in Adelaide and we have a um, deep uh, heritage in telecommunications research. And in 2013, we um, achieved a world first transmission of IoT data direct to a nano satellite. This is a really recent picture actually taken yesterday um, after the launch of one of our satellites on Rocket Labs. Um, so you might have seen some of that uh, on TV. Fleet um, also had a satellite on that rocket. It was very successful. Everyone's very happy. Um, all good things. And now I think we've got a little uh, reel. Does it work? Let me press again. Yeah. Uh, it's usually a little more interesting than that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, oh yeah, it's a... Uh... <laughs> oh man, doesn't, okay, can we, <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, that is that is exactly um, what it looks like. No, okay, okay, okay. I, I might just talk to it. So, oh, okay. Oh, right, okay. Cool. That's good to know. Is that okay? Yeah, it's normally kind of, it's got a little jingle. Um, but, yeah, but I w I'm not going to sing along. That would That would be too much for you. <laughs> but basically, this, this video is, is going to give you an idea of... Um, the kind of uh, industries that we target, um, what value we can bring to the industries and, and to um, the management of, of resources in places like Australia and, and globally. Cool. 
Cool. All right. And that is that is definitely our motto. Okay, so let's get to the, to the interesting stuff. Um, what is satellite IoT? Uh, do you want to go back? Thank you. Okay, so traditionally, <laughs> what you might be familiar with in, in, in the concept of IoT is terrestrial networks. So um, these address the urban need really well. So if we're talking about, um, you know, smart lights connected to your phone, um, street lights, smart bins, that kind of thing that are in, in um, Unley and that sort of thing, those things um, are addressed well by terrestrial IoT. But what that means is that 90% of the world's surface doesn't have IoT connectivity. So enter satellite IoT. We're going to bring global connectivity anywhere in the world. Sorry? E-T-I-O-T. -E Extra, very good, I like it. <laughs> I'm going to, Julia, our marketing is in the room. I'm sure she's taking oh, notes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, but satellites aren't new, right? So why is satellite IoT new? Um, so traditionally we have the terrestrial IoT services, cellular, ethernet, Wi-Fi, um, LP, WAN. Um, you'd be probably be familiar with the, with the kind of protocols on those networks. They're hub and spoke architecture. They make use of terrestrial gateways. Um, and satellite backhaul. Um, there, there's a high cost of infrastructure to get that set up. So, um, you know, it's, once it's up and running, it's good, but the cost of getting that up and running can be prohibitive. Um, and there's a lack of ubiquitous and global connectivity, um, particularly where population is, is scarce. Um, there's also sort of not standard regulations, so you can't necessarily roll out one solution globally. Um, so moving up from that, uh, we have existing satellite services, so we could use those. Um, so we call them the incumbent satellite OOT. Uh, so you're talking about Global Star, Iridium, um, companies that already have established satellite networks. They use um, geo satellites, which are great. They're very large and very expensive. Um, they're very far away, so um, over 36 thousand kilometers. Um, they're geostationary, so they offer 24-hour orbits. Um, they're in the microwave bands, um, and they can offer direct to orbit, or they can operate with um, backhaul connectivity. So what, what are the characteristics of this? Um, high power devices, um, high data costs as well, and large device antenna. Um, so this can meet some of the need, but if you're looking to monitor large numbers of low-cost devices, then satellite IoT is just going to be too expensive. Um, so enter new space satellite IoT. So the value of this service type is um, we use LEO satellites. So they're smaller, cheaper satellites. Um, they're in low Earth orbit, so much closer to Earth with 90-minute orbits. Um, we're operating in um, VHF, UHF bands, um, direct to orbit, and highly optimized algorithms. So in this case, this technology has been built specifically for IoT. Um, and so that's our secret source, essentially. Um, low data cost, small antennas. And you can see at the bottom there, it's, it's direct to orbit. Okay. Uh, so, um, so you can see here we've got um, our IoT sweet spot where you've got low path loss and low bandwidth. Um, as you move up, um, more and more power is required, so um, you get higher path loss. If, if, you, if you need the high bandwidth, then perhaps you're happy to pay the higher cost to get that service, but there's, there's a whole sector that doesn't require that, and, and so this is what we're addressing down here. Um, so what makes the Myriota network different? Um, so satellite IoT is a really exciting and emerging market. There are lots of new players. Um, it's, it's not easy for new players to get into and operate successfully, though. It's cost prohibitive, and um, not all satellite IoT is equal. So getting back to that secret source that we were talking about, um, our technology is patented, and um, it's unique in the world. Um, so My Myriad is the only satellite IoT provider offering a commercial direct-to-orbit satellite IoT service that meets all the key industry requirements. Low power, low cost, highly secure and available anywhere. 
So this is just a little diagram of how our system works specifically. Um, we have Myriota enabled devices on the ground. So these devices have um, the Myriota module integrated on board. Um, and those, those modules know about the, the, our satellite constellation. They know when those satellites are gonna come overhead. So the secret to their low power nature is that they basically sleep unless the satellite is coming overhead, in which case they turn on, they transmit, they receive, they turn off again. Um, so as the satellite comes over, they will um, send any queued messages. They will also, if, if there's any um, received data coming down, then they will um, receive network updates um, so that they stay um, synced with the constellation. Um, and then once the satellite goes over a ground station, we get the uh, um, transfer of data to the ground, to the ground station, and then that's processed in the cloud and forwarded onto the customer's destination. Um, so this is some cool, exciting stuff from our uh, related to our launch yesterday. This is one of our um, CubeSats here. Uh, this is one of the ones that was actually launched yesterday, and that there is the um, nose cone of the, of the rocket that um, sent up those satellites. So there's actually, I think, six or seven satellites um, there. You can't actually see ours because it's on the front. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of the last little bit that. Um, that from which the satellites are deployed when they reach the correct orbit. Okay, I'll hand you over to Steve. Okay. Thanks. So some of the applications for this technology are uh, available right now. So imagine if you're a farmer and you want to uh, check the level of a water tank. Up till now, people would have to drive out maybe 100 kilometres return trip to check the level of the water tank. And we could all be doing better things than that. So some of the, the uh, applications are things like water tank monitoring, remote rain gauges to manage uh, water resources, depth gauges and, and pressure sensors, temperature monitors. Also uh, for industrial applications and tracking applications. So being able to track a, an object or a, um, a piece of equipment in remote areas or in the ocean is uh, some of the areas that we're able to um, demonstrate right now. So what we thought we'd do is uh, give a bit of a demo today. So this is actually, we're gonna connect up to one of the modules that's on the roof next door. And uh, we're gonna show you how easy it is to connect up to the Miriota network. So we thought of an example of, let's say you've got a greenhouse and you're at work and you want to check that the, the temperature's right, the humidity's right for your, um, for your plants. You want to measure the temperature and humidity variation over time. But you don't have uh, wireless coverage in the area and might be a hill or something. So uh, what you can do is deploy the developer toolkit with a temperature sensor connected, and that way you get the, the data coming uh, via satellite direct to orbit uh, to your browser. So that could be on, on your phone or uh, on your laptop. And I'll go through now because we're uh, IoT meetup and it's um, wanna kind of showcase some of the tech. So I'll actually go through the demo uh, right now with, uh, with the one that we're connected to on the roof. Okay, so just um, the steps we're going to go through uh, one by one. So you check developer.miriota.com and then you download and clone the, from GitHub the SDK and maybe an application example to make your life easier. Install the SDK and then uh, on using Linux, one of the preferred ones for us is Windows WSL, but whatever flavor you, you like, we don't judge. Uh, get the developer toolkit and register for device manager, and then build the example application. Basically then you just upload the firmware, deploy and enjoy the fruits of your labor. Okay, here goes, demo is always exciting. Is it? Oh. Our screen share is coming. Okay, cool. 
Oh, okay. Just switch to the bit that you want. Do you want to dance? Okay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So we're just, um, we're time filling here with some really um, interesting content from the audience, um, basically trying to understand what people have done previously with IT technologies and whether we've got any experience. We had a little bit of um, Laura experience in the room. Um, you know, most people have kind of at least one IT device at home that they might use. Um, uh, I know... Uh, in our house, definitely um, the lights turn rainbow, which I think is the best use of technology yet. So very important stuff. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to tackle slightly bigger concepts around, you know, water usage in Australia and, um, you know, the big stuff, climate change, um, how we can monitor soils and, and get more out of our agriculture industry tracking um, important expensive assets um, as they travel across Australia. Um, one of the really cool actual use cases that always kind of rang true for me was around diesel tanks and just the concept that if you live on a farm and you've got a diesel tank, um, you know, that might be, you know, I mean, these farms are pretty big, so it might be a couple of k's away. You're not getting out there every day to check it. Um, if it runs out of fuel, then you have to call up, organise to get it refilled. That takes a couple of days. Meanwhile, some of your, you know, um, tractors or trucks or whatever they are offline. Um, whereas with IoT, basically you can keep, um, you, you don't have to do anything. You install the, the tank monitor. Um, as it gets to a certain point, it'll um, communicate with the... Um, Sorry. Oh, okay. Yes. Yeah, sorry. That was just a, that, I was just a voice from, from the side. I forget. Sorry. Apologies to everyone online. Um, yeah. So basically your, your tank monitor will communicate with your diesel fuel provider who will send a truck out and fill it up before it goes empty. And it's a really simple use case, but it makes a huge difference to farmers. Um, and one of our uh, sales, one of our sort of founding, the, the early members of the team who um, is our sales guy, um, he always likes to tell the story about uh, farmers where we put some of our early devices out um, to prove the technology, um, which we've been doing for a while. And uh, it was a water tank monitor and he, the farmer essentially went on holiday, which is the first time he's done that in a while, and would check his phone every morning to see what his tank monitor levels were, um, which he's able to do because of, of our IT technology. Um, and his feedback was that um, the numbers needed to be a little bit bigger on the app. So I think if that's the worst that your customers can say about your technology, I, I think we did all right. Um, yeah, so it's exciting um, watching that, you know, become a commercial reality for people and yeah, we're starting to roll out products, which is awesome. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it does. That's a really good question. So um, if you, uh, you can have either fixed devices or mobile devices. Obviously, if it's a mobile device, um, it's going to have GPS on board, in which case um, it will adjust its position naturally. Um, for fixed devices, we also have GPS, but as you move that device, you can essentially um, reset the module and it will, it will just come back online. It will know where it is. It will know where the satellites are and it will perform as before. So there's no issue with moving fixed devices and that sort of thing. It's able to recover with no, um, no uh, interactions, essentially. Yeah, the idea is with these devices that they are entirely remote and you don't need to go back to them. Yeah. Right, 
Can you hear me okay? Ah, oh, there we go. Some great advice my mum gave me, drink lots of water and never do a live demo. <laughs> Can everyone see that okay? Excellent. All right, so we're in the SDK directory here. We've already uh, cloned the SDK from GitHub just to make it a bit easier for those playing from home. Okay, so we'll go into the uh, directory of the examples. And this is where we're doing the pressure and humidity and temperature sensor. I'm just gonna show you how simple the application code is. Please don't judge me for my use of text browser. So you can see here that, that it's a pretty simple uh, main, main loop here, just getting the GPS and then schedule a job. Now what we'll do is we'll connect in to the unit that's up on the roof. So we've got a developer toolkit that's just next door. It's up on the, the roof there and we'll connect into it. Okay, now what we'll do is we'll reset the, the unit and we'll just reprogram, reflash the firmware. This might take a bit of time, so grab yourself a favorite beverage and uh, hang on tight. Okay, sure. So you'd have to flash the, <laughs> the firmware each time, obviously, but it just sort of be interesting to, uh, to show you how long it takes and that sort of thing. Uh, yeah, that's right. So now we've flashed the firmware and we're getting a um, GNSS fix for the location of the, of the unit. So while we're waiting for the, the fix, oh, there it is. Okay, so yeah, there we go, reading the temperature and pressure and humidity from the roof next door. Demo win. <laughs> okay, what I'm doing now is just um, we're going to have a, a bit of a graph of the temperature, humidity over the last few days. This is uh, the data that's been sent to what we call the message store. So this is uh, served from the satellite direct to orbit into the cloud. Oh, and we've got a bro broken pipe, okay. Let's not worry about that one. <laughs> I think there was there was a question online. Do we want to just go to the device manager? Yeah, well, uh, so this is the device manager. So this is the the web browser view of uh, of the location. So we've got a destination we've set up here. It could be an HTTPS or a AWS Lambda. We're um, sending it to message store, and uh, so it's sending us the location here. And then we've got a an app that uh, with a particular firmware gives us the location. As you can see here, the last send was at half past one UTC. 
So yeah, that's that's a demo. That's how easy it is to set up the uh, the developer toolkit with Mariota and connecting to space. Awesome. Oh. Oh, okay. So maybe we'll just, yeah, we'll, we'll grab some of the questions off the chat. Um, can devices speak with each other on the ground via anchors or example, or does each device have to connect to the satellite and then down again to a single data collection point? Yeah, so um, our network is direct to orbit, which means each individual device can communicate directly with the satellite. There's no um, requirement for any terrestrial infrastructure or, or communication between devices. Um, at the moment, modules don't communicate directly with one another. The, the aim is that they, they send up to the satellite. Um, yeah, but if you've, you've got, if you've got a use case, I'm keen to hear it. Say again. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, I believe we had another question. Does the device require a very clear view of the sky or can it work with obstructions nearby? Yes, so it works best with a very clear view of the sky. Um, so it is wireless technology. Um, uh, depending on what type of obstructions um, you're talking about, it, it can definitely still perform. Um, maybe you might have, if we're talking about um, cloud cover or um, tree cover and, and so forth, depending on how thick it is, um, you know, you may see some inconsistent performance, but, you know, uh, I wouldn't recommend putting it in a steel box. That's, that's definitely not going to work. But, yeah, it, it can definitely work um, with some obstructions. We have um, some, you know, there's lots of aspects of our technology that are unique and patented, and one of those is the concept that the device can actually learn in the field um, which parts of its sky view are... Um, uh, blocked and then it will basically not attempt to send if the satellite is positioned such that it knows it's not going to get through so that feeds back into the low power nature um, of the device it's not going to waste energy trying to send um, messages when um, it doesn't have clear sky view Okay, so uh, keep up to date with, with us. So you can follow us on the socials and also LinkedIn. Uh, and we've got a special offer tonight, which is to buy a developer toolkit for 10% off. Just follow that bit.ly link. And that uh, lasts until the end of April. Also check out our developer site and pretty soon we'll be having a, a community we're creating to uh, get everyone together um, understand the new updates and new features that we'll be releasing and help with Q&A and support and any questions you have. Okay, now we, we actually have one of our um, developer toolkits to give away. Um, we just have one question. We're going to check if everyone was listening. Um, so that question is, what is one of the ways that new space satellite IoT connectivity differs from terrestrial IoT connectivity? So we have to... We... <laughs> That, yeah, that's a good one. Yes, correct. <laughs> winner, winner. There we go. <laughs> All right. Cool. So we, we, want some, we want some pictures of what you do with it. <laughs> Are there any ideas for what you uh, use it for? Um, Let us know what you uh, use it for. This is a good question. Um, I was thinking about, like, uh, for using it for for the garden. Um, if I could actually track 
try and work out how to do the moisture content. Um, but once I come up with that, if I can get that working, then I'll come up with something better. <laughs> Great answer. There's some four to 20 milliamp or I squared C uh, moisture sensors. So yeah, I think you'll be in good hands. Okay, is that it from you guys? Okay, we do have a couple of questions. We have one question in the room. Um, I'll, I'll have to repeat your question into the microphone if that's all right. Um, but I'll just do one of the ones that's online first. Um, okay. Can devices, this is from the online chat, can devices speak with each other on the ground via anchors or does each device have to connect to the satellite and then down again to a single data collection point? I've already covered that one. You're, you're way behind. <laughs> Great. Another one. Is there any limit to the number of messages sent by the device? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so at the moment, our service uh, supports eight messages a day, and that is all forever increasing. We're always adding to that in increasing the capacity of the network. Um, so yeah, no. Essentially, no, you could keep sending messages as much as you want, but at the moment, our service um, is eight, a message, eight messages a day of service for 20 byte messages. All right. This might be a sticky one, but I'm going to ask it because someone asked it. Um, can you provide some indicative costs for IoT connectivity and data transfer? Is there a setup on usage? Are there plans available? How does ongoing billing work, et cetera? Yeah, that's a good one. So it's really cheap. We designed it to be super, super low cost. So you're talking cents per message, which is pretty amazing. And the, the module itself uh, costs about 50 bucks. All right, we have a question in the room, two questions in the room. Uh, I'll get, I'll repeat it after. Um, so you've got a 90 minute what, what does that make for uh, the average and maximum So you've got a 90 minute orbit, what does that mean for the latency of the message? Yeah? Yeah, so the more satellites we have on network, the, the latency drops down. So, yeah, we're uh, targeting as we go further from, you know, 24 hours down to sub one hour. So we, just the one we launched yesterday, that's going to be a big improvement in the latency. Yeah. We had another question in the room, I think. No? Same question? Another one? Will you license the tech for embedded systems or is it just standalone? Yeah, another great uh, question. So in these developer kits, we have what's called the module, which is that tiny um, little piece of electronics that I was showing in the, the intro. That's the thing that you can design a PCB and connect up to your microcontroller or your uh, modem or in any embedded system and basically connect up an antenna on the other end and away you go. Have another question in the chat. Does the developer kit include sensors and what sensors does Miriota provide and manufacture? And I have a question on top of that is, can you add any other sensors or does it have to be a special sensor? So the limit is really your imagination. So we've got a number of uh, interfaces. So, you know, I squared C, UART, AT modem and that sort of thing. So there's really, the sky's the limit as far as the connectivity of the sensors. So. You could have I squared C, you could have an 8 to 20 milliamp sensor. Um, we haven't even thought of what the possibilities are and we'd love to hear from the developer community about what's possible. Nice one. Any questions in person? Uh, yep. Um, once the data is uploaded to the cloud, what can we do with it then? How can we use it is the question. That's another great question. So you can uh, access the messages by either an HTTPS or a, a AWS Lambda uh, endpoint. And so you can get the, the data via a message, message queue. And so uh, then again, the sky's the limit as well. So REST API and you can uh, basically just get the, the data and then process it yourself, do all that excellent stuff like um, you know data analytics and machine learning. APIs are the best, I love APIs. Um, yeah, another question? Data lakes? 
Do we have any, did they have any data lakes is the question? No, we don't. What we do is uh, provide the, the communication service, so an encrypted, end-to-end -end encrypted uh, uh, setup so that that improves the security and, and privacy. And then once you're happy with it, you can unpack the data and you know, put it into a data lake or a database. Love it. I have a couple more questions um, on the chat and then I'll get to another one in person. Um, what was your first IoT device? And then I want to ask the audience if you can beat that. Like, what was your first IoT device? Not necessarily Mariota, but the first IoT device you worked on. Do you want to go first, maybe? Uh, I definitely, for the company, it was a water tank monitor, I believe. Um, um, and my first IoT device was definitely the one that I set up with my developer toolkit when I joined Mariota. Um, and I think that was a pressure sensor. Pressure sensor. Uh, mine's on the GitHub, my GitHub account. It was a, a temperature controller for a barbecue meat smoker. <laughs> I love that. It's cool getting into IoT with something practical you can use at home. I want to hear from you guys what was your first IoT device too. Um, another question. In person, any question? You have one? Yep. So the question is on encryption. Is it really end to end and you can't see the data? Yeah, so that's the beauty of it because we don't see the data. There's no concerns about privacy. Basically, it's an envelope that we don't unpack at any stage through the journey. Um, the last part of, say, for HTTPS is a, is a TLS. So um, you're safe in the knowledge that the, the data will get sent to you without us doing anything mean to it. All right, I'm going to ask if developer Steve has any other questions in the chat. All right, in, I've got one there from Abhishek. In which parts of the world is the satellite connectivity available? Good question. Yeah, so across Australia, New Zealand and Canada, we have connectivity um, coming very soon, the US. Um, and after that, we're looking at Europe, Africa, South America. Um, so the list just goes on. It is a truly global service. And um, yeah, we're adding regions all the time. Oops, that was a bit premature of me. Um, another question in the audience. Does Australia also include Papua New Guinea? Um, you know what? I'm, I'm going to have to ask my spectrum guy. Good point. Um, all right. I might stop it there. And if there's any more questions in the chat, I'll bring these guys back at the end. Um, but can we please have a round of applause for Nicole and Steve from Mariota? <laughs> Thank you. I'm sure there'll be lots more questions because, you know, we all have our different specialties in the Internet of Things and IoT here, um, but we're all learning something new from each other. So it's really cool to have that chat. Seems like lots of people here are knowledgeable enough that they can answer some, ask some really good questions too. So thanks for that. Um, I did forget to mention everyone in person, if you could please scan the COVID safe QR thing at Stone and Chalk before you leave today, that would be great. Uh, the bar is still also Open, yeah, yep. So also open if you guys want to grab a drink. Um, we also have some swag and goodies lying around on the tables um, from Telstra Developer. I also haven't introduced myself. So my name's Michelle. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, I'm from Telstra Developer, which is Telstra's API and IoT marketplace. That's all I'll say, now you know who I am. Um, and I'm still doing a prize. So if you guys missed at the start, we're doing a Arduino IoT giveaway for, so we had a Mirioda giveaway already. Congratulations, you have a win in the room. This one, anyone online can also um, go to. So if you just post on Twitter or any social media, hashtag OzIoT and do a tech pun, then um, developer Steve and developer Ali are gonna pick the best one, the funniest one that makes them laugh out loud. And you can go home with an Arduino IoT device with a Telstra SIM and yeah. Uh, and I think that was all of the, housekeeping. I did want to also mention that this session is being recorded. So if you guys, it's okay because I spoke your questions, but if anyone on the chat wants to come off mute later, or if you guys want to grab the mic, we are recording the session and it will be up on YouTube. So anyone who has to leave if you're online or if you want to watch it again to like, get it to sink in the satellite IoT stuff, um, then you can rewatch on YouTube Oz IoT. Um, that's enough from me for now. I'm going to hand over to developer Steve, who's going to introduce our next speaker. Thanks, developer Steve. I'll go and put myself on mute.
Oh, I just did it. Hello, everyone. Um, how good was that talk? I had like I I I love space. I, I may show in the current seat I'm in. But anyway, yeah, I've always been a big fan of finding out more and how to use that stuff. And also love that question. And our next speaker has done some work in space, not personally, well, not directly, not yet. A few more years, a few more years. But anyway, um, we're about to be joined by um, someone that does some amazing work on projects. I always love seeing his posts. I love seeing his live streams. And here he comes now. Um, I, uh, I could say all the nice things about him, but those that, for those of you that are already following him, you'll already see uh, a lot of the YouTube stuff he does, and particularly using IoT in uh, accessibility, just to help folks um, be able to do some um, like do things again um, from robotic arms and all sorts of amazing things. So, uh, on that note, and he's here now, uh, Jonathan Oxer. Hello, you wonderful people, and thank you, Steve and Michelle and Ali. Have I joined? Thank okay, you. audio is working. Steve, give me the thumbs up. Yes, yes. Well, awesome. Uh, is, is this the thumbs down? I don't oh, know. That's a thumb <laughs> sideways. That's close <laughs> enough. <laughs> thank you. Over to as long as it's a thumb, it'll do. <laughs> so that Mariota presentation was really cool, and uh, Michelle promoted this presentation, this session tonight as being sort of space themed. So I have to start with one little thing. And uh, where are we? I'm going to go to overhead here. So this is um, part of a project that some of you may have heard of from quite a few years ago. The PCB that's on the top with all the blinking lights on it, that is the RGSAT payload processor module, which flew in space on RGSAT X and RGSAT 1. And it's sitting on top of a, a ground test breakout. This is a, a breakout that basically gets mounted inside a thermal vacuum chamber for, uh, for testing. And you pass power through to the device that you're testing through the wall of the vacuum chamber. Uh, but that, is, that little board has 17 MCUs on it. And uh, so there were five of these boards that were built. Two of them flew in space in late... 2013, November 2013, I think they were deployed. And then they deorbited, which means they burned up into a big fiery ball in early 2014 after running many, many experiments in space. That's not what I'm here to talk to you about today, though. <laughs> That's just a cool thing to try to stick to the, the theme. So what are we talking about today? Uh, a few years ago, I was working on this project that you can see right here. This is a hand heater for use by people who have Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which one of the side effects of which is losing the ability to shiver and to regulate your own body temperature. So the idea is to make little hand heaters that are mounted on wheelchairs. Uh, sorry, I think my, I'm gonna get rid of this. Might've been knocking the microphone. So the idea is that it blows warm air onto the hands of the wheelchair user so that they can keep control of the joystick and uh, control the wheelchair properly. But the issue, if we um, scroll down a little bit, is that they are inside a steel enclosure and there is nowhere to put a USB connection on it. And we don't necessarily want to expose USB anyway. We want to be able to load firmware onto these and then have the box closed up and it is the way it is. If I wanted to put a USB socket on the back here, I'd have a bit of trouble. There just isn't room. And uh, so what we have is an ESP32. I just used a Vroom32 module built into it. And you can see that the internal structure has the fan that blows the air through and the uh, resistors on the right, which are the heating element. And there is a connector right in the middle there, which is where I wanted to be able to flash it. And this is one of the PCBs. So you can see, if you can see my cursor there, there is a four-way header right there. And that is connected to ground 3.3 volts, TX and RX. And I've also got a flash button connected to GPIO zero and a reset button. So we have the classic situation where we want to load new firmware onto an ESP series chip, which means we have to put it into bootloader mode the way to achieve that is to hold GPIO zero low while the chip is powering up. So what you can do is hold down the flash button, press reset, let go of flash, and then it's in bootloader mode and ready to receive new firmware. 
but that is a bit of a pain. And so I started looking around for header formats that I could use to make an external device that I could plug into this. Now, part of the inspiration for this came from, now I just need to, where am I? Here it is, the WESP32. So the WESP32 is this really cool little ESP32 based board with ethernet and power over ethernet support. And um, it was designed by Patrick Vaughan uh, Ostevic. And you can see that there is a header on it right in the middle here. There is a six pin header and there is no USB. So what he's done is designed a programming device or programming adapter that plugs into this and if we come along to the WESP32 PROG submodule, what you see here is a six pin header with the USB interface on it. And it's got the USB to serial converter chip. And it also includes the circuit that does the auto reset for the target board. So it takes care of GPIO zero, holding it low while the reset is taking place. And the idea with this is that you can plug it into your target board, do the programming, and then take this board away again. You don't need to leave it in your target. Now, if your project needs USB, it makes sense to just put USB on it, put on the USB to serial converter and put on the auto reset circuit, which we'll look at in just a second as well. But a lot of the time you don't need that. You just need to load the firmware. And often what you'll do is you will load initial firmware, which might have OTA support. So then you do over the air updates for any uh, other firmware. So in a lot of situations, you will do an initial load and test and then you don't need a hard connection to the device anymore. So I started looking around for ways that I could put that similar sort of header on my own projects. And one of the big considerations was the Sonoff. And I'm sure many of you have seen these and have played around with them. The Sonoff Basic has this programming header, which has ground, TX, RX, and 3.3 volts. And in fact, if you go back to my little hand heater, oh, and what I can do is I'll switch to front. So this is one of the hand heaters right here. So that's the real thing. This is a different version to what's in the photo, but uh, it's very similar. This one has a six pin header on it instead of a four pin programming header, but it's the same basic idea. Oh, and this is the same thing, but in the metal enclosure. So this metal enclosure was laser cut and then CN folded by a, like a CNC controlled folding machine to fit around our, our circuit board. So what I did with this version was I put on the exact same header as the Sonoff Basic because uh, many people are already familiar with the process of reflashing a Sonoff. And so I wanted to be able to uh, use an established process, not have something new. So all of this was driven by the goal of trying to have some kind of a common process that can be used across multiple devices and projects. So I started looking around at what other people have done because I thought surely other people have done the same sort of thing. There must be a standard sort of programming header that people use. And one thing that I found was if I jump down here, that Espressif themselves have produced this board called the ESP Prog, and that's ESP hyphen Prog. You have to be careful of that because there is another board called ES Prog or ESP Prog without the hyphen. In fact, it's only got one P in there, which is not the same thing. And many, many people have tried to solve this problem and done it in different ways. So with the Espressif ESP Prog, it has uh, JTAG headers on here, which is really cool. You can use JTAG for debugging while you're doing your software development. And it also has this flashing header. And what they chose to do was use a two by three header. And uh, which, uh, when I first saw this, I thought that's a bit of a pain, but I'm gonna get back to that. It's really interesting that they chose to use a two by three box header on here. They've also got a selector so that you can uh, decide whether you want to supply five volts or 3.3 volts to your target. And one thing to keep in mind that's very important is that uh, ESP8266 and ESP32 devices don't like five volts. They only like 3.3 volts, certainly on their supply line and on their IO pins as well. So I started looking around 
at what people have used on their own projects. And I made up a little table, and this is basically what I came up with. And it seemed that there was no consensus at all. It was all over the place. <laughs> uh, Christopher said they definitely don't like 12 volts. <laughs> I'm sure there's a, there's a story about how you discovered that. <laughs> um, so the, yeah, I made up a, a list of all of these little header formats. And what you can see is, yeah, which one is it? ESP prog. This is the two by three header, which is the official Espressif header. And you can see they've exposed the enable pin. There is a selectable power pin, TX and RX, they've got ground and GPIO zero. So these are all the pins that you need to be able to put a target board into bootloader mode and upload new firmware, but also to be able to reset it without putting it into bootloader mode or to be able to just communicate with it if you want to be able to interact with software that is running on the target device. And as you can see, it's all over the place. Many people have looked at this problem and then just come up with their own for a one-off project or have uh, wanted it to be a bit more widely adopted. But when I started asking around about this a couple of years ago, there really just was no consensus. It was all over the place. And there are a couple of interesting suggestions. One, in, uh, so this is the WESP32, which is the, uh, which is Patrick's board that I showed you just a moment ago. But one of the interesting suggestions came a bit out of left field was to use the same header, the two by four that is used on the ESP01 module which is the very first ESP based module that came out. That's really what popularized the processor. And in the very early days, everyone was playing with ESP 01s. The header exposes everything that you need to be able to reflash it. So one of the options was just to use the exact same format because people have built programmers for the ESP 01 modules. It also includes GPIO2 and it's got both reset and ESP enable. Uh, so it has a couple of unnecessary pins and the two by four format is not necessarily what people would want to use. So I kind of discounted that, but it was a very interesting suggestion. So the really critical thing that guided me on this was trying to maintain compatibility with the Sonoff. So I have been over to China and visited ITED and some of you might may have seen a video I did a couple of years ago, which was a tour of the Sonoff factory and showing the production line where the Sonoff units are manufactured. And I've spoken to them quite a few times about whether they would be open to changing their programming header. And if we go back to this one right here, so change the existing header so that instead of only exposing these four pins, they expose the reset and IO zero pin so that we could have a standardized programming header for Sonoffs. And they actually really like the idea. It's been discussed within their engineering department and it is quite possibly going to happen, but it's been a very long cycle. And they also have to keep in mind there are different form factors. The Sonoff basic is a simple rectangle, but they make many different shaped devices. So they need to take into consideration having a header format that will suit all of their different physical formats. So one of the big questions is what voltage to provide through the header. If you are providing a connection from your computer to a target device, one reasonable approach is to provide five volts into it on the assumption that it is going to be regulated down on the target. But I don't really like that idea. I, in my personal opinion, if you are connecting to a target board, then all of the voltages that you expose to that target should be within the maximum operating parameters of that board. So whatever you know, Vmax is on the target board, you should not provide more than that. So that was one of the reasons that I didn't adopt Patrick's WESP32 header. Uh, it's because of this five volts. And the other is because I wanted to be able to convince IT to extend this header. Now they can't extend it down this way because the button is there. They could extend it up this way with some fairly minor changes. So one of my objectives was to start with these four pins and then add the extra two pins that we need at the top. And if we have a look, so that's what I've got here. 
So what I did was come up with the idea of the ESP flash header format, beginning with the Sonoff header and with ground as the starting point, because that is the one that is closest to the button. So you can't go past that point. And then just extend it by adding the extra two pins that we need. So what this gives us is a header format that gives us the communication that we need, uh, just like a regular Sonoff but it also gives us the pins we need to be able to do the auto reset process. And so this was the result of my, of taking all of those design constraints and distilling it down. And I ended up with this pin out. Uh, now the thing is that there is also the two by three header format that is used in the official Espressif ESP prog. And so I thought, well, if we're going to start uh, defining a convention for a programming header, maybe what we should do is have a couple of options. Have a one by six header, because that's a very convenient thing to do. It's simple on a target board to just have a row of pads and then a header that you plug in. But the official Espressif header is two by three in this format. So what I ended up doing was documenting two different header formats and in two different pitches which is unfortunate, but it's actually not that too, that much of a problem. So what I've ended up with is the one by six header format in either 0.1 inch or 0.05 inch pitch and the two by three header format in 0.1 inch or 0.05 inch pitch. So uh, unfortunately, what I'm trying to do here is merge two very different constraints and one of the really bad side effects of that is that the pin numbers don't match. So we've got a one by six header with pin one as ground, and we've got a two by three header where pin one is the enable pin, which really sucks. So this is how the pin assignments end up. And when I was puzzling over this, I was trying to come up with a way to rationalize the pin numbers, and I just couldn't come up with anything that made sense. So this is what I ended up with. And this is what I've ended up implementing on many of my own projects. Now, what I've also done is an implementation of a flashing device. So the ESP flasher, which is an implementation of the USB to serial converter with the auto reset circuit designed to suit this particular header format. And it's got the auto reset circuit on here. And to go with that, a, an ESP flash adapter, which is like a little octopus header. It takes the one by six in here, you plug this into the other adapter, and then it gives you all of the other possible formats. So with those two simple boards, it covers all of the options that you can see on here. So where to go with this? Okay, um, one thing that I've found, if I switch back to overhead for a moment and move this out of the way, what I ended up doing was implementing the two by three header on a number of projects. And you can see one just here. This is an air quality sensor project. It's got an ESP32 on the back and there is a little programming header here. Now this particular board also has a USB to serial converter on it. It's got USB-C. So technically this header isn't needed, but I put it onto this project because it just happened to be one of the first ones that I was working on at the time I was doing this and I wanted to experiment with the two by three header format in a situation where it didn't matter to me really it was just an experiment and what I found is that this header format is incredibly convenient so what I have here is that little adapter board with a 1.27 millimeter pitch IDC cable we can plug that into the ESP flasher and then plug this into the target and what I found is that my original concept was to have the, this adapter board plugged directly into the target, which then tethers your USB cable to the target. And I've already, I've done that on a number of projects as well. And that is quite good the way it was originally envisaged. But I've also found it to be super convenient to do this because it means that you have this very lightweight, flexible cable, which is connecting to your target. It's not putting any strain on it. You don't have a big USB cable hanging off there. And it allows you to do all of the auto reset and everything necessary to upload the uh, upload new firmware onto the target device. 
So I've become a really big fan of the two by three programming header in a uh, in the 0 0.05 inch pitch. And because it's a shrouded header, you can't plug it in the wrong way. It takes up very little space on the target board. And uh, I've I've ended up designing that into about that particular format of the header into I think about five or six different projects now. So just to let's have a quick look at um, the design of this just to break it down a little. So this is the schematic for the uh, for the ESP flasher, which is the USB to serial adapter. So we've got a USB C connection on here, passes through to the USB to serial converter. And very importantly, we've got connections here from DTR and RTS. Those go into this little circuit, which consists of two transistors and two resistors. And what it does is the little dance that controls the state of the enable or reset pin and GPIO zero. So from the software which drives this, which could be uh, something like Tasmatizer or you know one of any of the command line tools that you use for uploading uh, code to uh, to these targets. What they can do is use DTR and RTS to set the uh, the modes correctly on here, so that all you have to do is click up and click upload, and everything is taken care of. And there is also a 3.3 volt power supply. This particular one is rated to 600 milliamps because. ESP32s can take a fair bit of power. When they first start up in particular, they run a calibration routine on their Wi-Fi, which involves cranking the amplifier up to maximum power, and it can briefly uh, draw quite a large amount of power. So with this particular board, what you can do is both power and uh, communicate with the target. So. It's a little bit deceptive. It's a very, very small board. It looks big when it's on the screen like that, but that whole thing is tiny. So this thing that you see over the side here, that is the USB-C socket. So what I would be really interested to know is how other people have solved this particular problem and whether they have suggestions for ways to make it better. Um, oh, one other thing that I found is really handy is making up a little flying lead adapter. And if we go back to the overhead here, so this is an example of how I use it. I have this flying lead adapter, which has got the one by six header. And I can just plug that into here. And then it breaks out all of the connections. So I've got uh, ground power, TX, RX, reset and GPIO zero. What I'm doing in this case is reflashing a DETA uh, PowerPoint. So this is a two-year based device, which has got an ESP8266 in it. And uh, so having a flying lead like this means that I can solder onto a target board and then have auto reset and be able to treat that target board just like a Node MCU board, which is really, really nice when you're playing around with software on it. You don't have to keep doing the little dance on the buttons to put it into flashing mode or try to hold a jumper in place. And while you're holding it there, then power cycle it or reset it to get bootloader mode to come up. So something like uh, these little flying lead adapters can be a super helpful thing as well because the behavior of the GPIO zero pin and the reset pin are all taken care of in the flashing adapter which makes them very good to use it. So, uh, uh, okay, so <laughs> it's time for some questions, I think. And let's see what is coming up here. So I'm gonna have a quick look in Q and A. <laughs> is this one non explodey if you put it on backwards? <laughs> Someone asked, it looks like it would be. Um, I haven't tried. That was actually a consideration. When in the design, if you look at the pinout, if and in fact, that's the same order of what you can see on the screen right here, what you would end up with is 3.3 volts on the RX pin and ground would be up here. So it shouldn't be exploded if you put it on backwards. 
Now, do we have any other questions? I'm just going to jump in there with the questions thing. Um, yeah, and thanks, Krista, for asking that question. Um, I especially love the exploded bit. But um, for those that are, all right, if anyone does have any questions online, please put them into the Q&A section. For those that are IRL, uh, we're going to cross over to a minute to Michelle, who will ask questions. Then Michelle will go on mute so we don't hear that echo as well with your, with your answer. <laughs> OK, thanks, Dave. Don't think we have any more online, so we might bring Michelle in. Um, Michelle. Oh, I should do the whole, um, our on-ground reporter, on-ground reporter. <laughs> okay. uh, I'm back here. Uh, any questions from the audience? If you don't mind, do you want me to bring the microphone out to you? No? Okay. Tell me and then I'll tell. How does the flashing device know when to reset? That's the question. All ah, right, the, that is taken care of by the software. So from the software side, you need a board profile. Um, so a little bit of this is building on the work that was done in Node MCU. Uh, Node MCU implemented a, an auto reset circuit. And so if you are using software to do the flashing, if you tell it that you are talking to a node MCU, this system behaves exactly the same way. And so it handles the DTR and RTS pins correctly. Just before we go to IRL, Christopher's got, um, I think it's a question, um, or I think it's just Christopher geeking out. Christopher, love your work, either way. Um, I've never understood why those two transistors on DTR and RTS are for. I use the same pin out as Arduino Pro Mini, which is also the FTDI programmable cable. I've used FTDI to do something similar before. They are so handy. <laughs> um, no transistors is that bad. As long as it doesn't explode, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not bad. Actually, that's a that's a really good point because I had a number of people say, just put an FTDI header on it and be done. The issue with that is that the behavior of DTR and RTS is very unpredictable, particularly if you grab cheap USB to serial converters. It's a situation where it might work in certain situations, but it's unpredictable. And so what I wanted was some kind of a header where I would I have a known uh, format that was, in some ways it was deliberate to make it different to an FTDI header so that if you have a flasher that is designed to work with it, you know it will definitely work with it. I've seen many, many uh, tech support threads in forums and things where people are saying, I'm using an FTDI header to try to upload code to an ESP chip and it's not working. And it's because of varying behavior of DTR and RTS on the different converters. So a lot of the really cheap USB to serial converters that you buy out of China have the CH340G chip on them, which I absolutely hate. It's the only USB to serial chip that I've had kernel panic my Mac. <laughs> so I avoid that. But it, yeah, it's one of those situations where if you put an FTDI header on it, um, you can probably make it work but not guaranteed. I was gonna say, it's almost an achievement to crash a Mac. I know it's not impossible and clearly you've done it, but like it's way easier yep. than some, some other operating systems. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Michelle, did you? Yeah. Are there any yeah. questions from the audience in Adelaide? Any other questions? While you guys are thinking, I just wanna say, um, Jonathan, you're a legend. Um, I love that. I was thinking that was a virtual background. Like, oh yeah, he wants us to make him think that his office is like really cool and he's got all these toys. But I'm pretty sure it's real. Yeah, it's the um, lab. I yeah, yeah, it's the lab. Glass files yeah, and I, put I get glass files and put colored liquid in it. Just, we're a scientist as well. I was looking um, at your bio. We've got it shared on the screen over here. I think it's just awesome that you've you know headed up the Linux in Linux Australia. Um, but I wanted to ask about the RFID chip. It says here you've surgically implanted an RFID chip. So while the yes. Adelaide crew is thinking of another yes. question, um, we can yeah ask you about that. Sure. <clears throat> so this is rather old news now. I think it was about 14 years ago that I did it. It's in my left forearm, just around here somewhere. And what I implanted was the same chip 
that is used for identifying cats and dogs. So it's a pet RFID tag. And these days it's, it's pretty common. Like there are many, many hundreds of people in Australia who have RFID or um, NFC or, you know, various types of implants. And uh, Amal Grafstra at Dangerous Things has, uh, he sells them. So you can just buy them and find someone to implant them. It was a bit more difficult when I did it. I think I might have been the first person in Australia to do it and possibly about the third person in the world to do it. And so what I had to do, you couldn't just buy them at the time. What I actually had to do was contact a wholesale supplier for vets and pretend that I was working on a research project um, because normally you can only buy them in quantities of like hundreds or thousands at a time. And I only wanted one to implant. So I contacted a wholesale veterinary equipment supplier and said, you know, I'm working for this company and I'm, I need a, a couple of units for testing purposes. <laughs> and they ended up sending me 10. Um, but yeah, it was not an easy thing to do at the time. IRL. So <clears throat> any questions in the <clears throat> building in Adelaide? No further questions? All right. We might um, leave it at that for questions for you, Jonathan, but you, unless you wanted to develop a Steve, something else? No? No, he looks good. Oh, uh, I was going to ask. Um, <laughs> oh, I was going to ask. You ask it. You ask it. <laughs> okay. I was just going to say that if you guys have any questions for Jonathan, um, we can put them, I can put them in the chat here. Or if you're on the chat, you can put them in the chat, obviously, um, and we can do those. But first, I was going to say we could do the next part of tonight, which was project sharing. Oh, what is this? Oh, yeah. Whoops. We should have talked about that before. All right. Oh, yes. I'll also mention that we do this um, meetup monthly, but um, oops, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Jonathan. <laughs> Thank you, Jonathan, right. for your talk. Bye. And, um, yeah, just hang around in the chat if we have any more questions for you. Just before you go, just before hang on, you go. don't interrupt on mute. There we go. So I don't hear myself anymore. Um, yeah, just before we cut away to that, I, I wanted to do a big shout out to Superhouse TV that I really love. So Jonathan does a whole bunch of amazing projects on this channel. If you're not yet subscribed and you're into IoT stuff, you need to be subscribed. I don't know where I was going with that, but you definitely need to be subscribed. Please check it out. Um, this project and a whole bunch of others are there. Um, yeah, did you want to uh, add to that, Jonathan? Uh, no, no, thanks for the shout out. <laughs> That's right. I highly recommend it. It's worth checking out. Um, also, just before you go, I do have one one last question. I thought Michelle was going to ask, but I'm going to ask it anyway. Is what was your first IoT device? Uh, I was thinking about that in the question earlier. <clears throat> I've been doing that sort of stuff for a very, very long time. Uh, like, when was it? It was probably back in the late 90s. Um, I was using parallel ports to interface devices to the internet, then using, um, using Perl scripts. So, nice. yeah, Perl basically to communicate with the parallel port and then turn things on and off. Wow, nice. Yeah, and that it was... would have been it would have been late nineties. And then around two thousand, in my, in a professional capacity, I helped build a remote management system for F for refrigerant compressors used in high rise buildings. And that um, I went over to Canada for that and uh, helped build a little data center slash control room in Montreal which was used to monitor refrigeration systems all over the world. And that was in 2000. Wow. And that was all pre-MQTT, no doubt, as well. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was all HTTP. <laughs> nice. <laughs> um, wow, that would have been heavy on those. Like, it's heavy now on some of the small devices, but it would have been even heavier with that stuff. Yeah, that was hard work. We, um, we What we ended up doing was repurposing set-top boxes. So we found a supplier <laughs> of... Uh, set-top boxes that were used in hotels because they were x86 architecture and then we ran Linux on them and those devices were then put in, into an enclosure and bolted onto the side of the air conditioning system in the high-rise building and connected to Ethernet in the building management system 
and then uploaded its data, sent it across to Montreal, and we shoved it into a MySQL database. And then we had a control room that was like NASA. Uh, we basically, we actually deliberately set it up to be like mission control with curved control panels. And there was a glass wall so that customers could walk in and look through the window and go, oh, look at all the shiny stuff. <laughs> look at the <laughs> look at all the little dials and things. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, by the sound of it, you do the same thing I do walking around as an IoT lover. Like you walk around and see stuff. You're like, oh, what can I use that for? And I can hook that up to a thing. And, yeah. Um, yeah. No, amazing. And thank you very much for such an amazing talk. No worries. Thanks, Dave. Over to you, Michelle. Okay, I'm just going to get everything going again. Thank you. And um, thank you to both the speakers tonight. Jonathan, like I said, you're a legend. I was going to say a bloody legend, but I thought it was inappropriate. I said it anyway. You're a bloody legend. Um, and I just saw on the chat that Christopher posted that his first IoT device was in 1996-ish. Could anyone in the room here beat that, their first IoT device before 1996? No? Anyone like in the 90s, put your hand up if you had IoT. In the, oh, no, actually, you know what? That might be embarrassing for you. Don't worry. But Christopher, you win. Well done. There's no prize for that. Maybe next time we'll do a prize. Um, I also, so of course, thank both of our speakers for tonight in person and online. And also thank you to Stone and Chalk, the legends that are here um, in Adelaide in lot 14 that are helping us out. I saw one of the puns. So on the, I think it was on Twitter, hashtag OzIoT. Someone posted a pun tonight. We should call it IoT14 but it doesn't make sense if you say it out loud. So you've got to read it. Lot 14, IOT 14. You'll get it later. You'll get it tomorrow. Um, 1999, Abhishek. All right, cool. So the next thing I'll mention is that this meetup is monthly. Like I said, this is the first time we've done it um, like half in person, half online, just because I was so super excited that we had a fellow Adelaide group to speak. Um, you can register on the meetup group and we'd love to hear from you as well. So you guys online, you guys watching this on YouTube later and everyone in the room, um, if you have a project big or small to share, it could be your first IoT project or you could find someone who can beat Chris's 1996. Um, and host a hub of your own. If you're listening like in Perth or in Sydney or whatever, you can host one of these and we could you know, really test the limits of like live demo stuff and do multiple ones, um, multiple hybrid hubs, which would be cool. Right. Yeah. Oh. What I wanted to do while I had the mic was to see if anyone in the in-person group wanted to share something that they've been working on with IoT. Um, I know it's a bit more pressure than like just going off mute because you guys are in person. Um, but do any of you want to come up and talk about something that you're working on in the IoT space? And there's a couple of other meetups in Adelaide in tech and IoT and things like that going on. Or anyone want to share? It doesn't have to be a question. Um, obviously, no pressure. But anyone want to shout out something about IoT? Someone's been thrown under the proverbial bus. Come on. Yeah, come, come on. Come on down. To the front. Who have we got here? Craig. Thanks. So we're going to get you to stand. There's the camera there. So, yeah. There you go. Um, good evening. Um, my name is Craig McVeigh. I'm uh, from a company called Simile. Uh, we're a tech company that's based in East Timor. Um, but we do a whole lot of uh, IoT and uh, cloud computing. And... Um, We've uh, created our own sort of range of IoT equipment. So we've got a, a data logger that we've been working on for a, um, a number of years. And we connect uh, a range of different sensors to that data logger that feeds back to our platform. And we do a range of analytics uh, with that. So um, I'm not a tech guy. My background is water, but I've got a, uh, my business partner's a software engineer and, um, and a sort of backyard shed sort of a hardware tech hack, and now we've got a, a team of about 14 people all sort of working on this, these projects. Um, but we apply IoT to a range of different things from community water supply monitoring, so remote communities in, in mountain areas of Timor-Leste who have big issues with the reliability and supply of water. Uh, we also apply it to... Um, uh, flood alert systems. So that's a big thing that we're doing at the moment. Uh, so we're monitoring 
uh, meteorological state like meteorological stations, uh, IoT based meteorological stations, uh, water level, uh, water quality, those types of things, soil moisture, and linking it to global weather forecasting and alert systems for governments. Uh, and we're about to develop a, um, well, about to start the implementation of a, a citywide uh, flood alert system using IoT and cloud computing in Timor Leste, which is something that's not really done even, there's not too many cases where it's being done here in Australia. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's basically it. And, you know, we've, we've sort of got a, a workshop and a lab and we're doing all sorts of other R&D in that space as well. Happy to answer any questions. Sure. Uh, we are, yep. Yeah. Um, we've, oh, sorry, uh, the question was whether we're dabbling in machine learning. Uh, the answer is yes. Uh, in house, uh, uh, there's a couple of people in our team who are very interested in it, so they've been working, uh, just playing around. We have a project that we, um, we sought funding, got innovation funding uh, through Mercy Corps International, which is a big NGO plus uh, uh, the Microsoft um, Earth Sciences Grant or something. It was a small grant to set up uh, an AI platform uh, to help predict flood. And so we're, we're moving that forward and we're, uh, we're just kind of finished off that project. Half the challenge is um, COVID and supply chains into Timor um, for some of our equipment. So there's been a few sort of challenges over the last 12 months with that. But yeah, definitely machine learning is, is the way we're going with some of that work. Uh, at the moment, it's, oh, sorry, the question was around uh, what connectivity you were using. So at the moment it's 3G, 4G. We have actually spoken to you guys about using satellite, uh, but um, uh, the challenge in Timor, you need um, bandwidth regulatory approval that's going to take forever um, and it'll probably never happen. <laughs> so, um, but I mean, as our company's never been about Timor, it's been about the region. So, you know, we would like to incorporate satellite technologies into that. Yeah. All right, thank you. Thank you so much for jumping up and having a, a chat about the project you're working on. I've seen the chat's pretty keen. Everyone's like, yeah. Crowd of talented people in Adelaide, you know it. Um, does anyone else want to do a shout out? You don't have to stand up if you really don't want to. You can just tell me and I'll shout it out. I really want to get a pressure sensitive bowl that isn't like that can actually measure pressure from all different angles. So if you could pick it up and it could tell you just like how strong someone's squeezing it. If anyone wants to come and talk to me about how that's possible, um, I'd love to chat. Oh, okay, so yes, it's specifically for um, brain injury patients doing exercises. So we're making exercises in virtual reality, but I, I wanna get data out of them in particular, like muscle strength. Um, and an IoT ball is the most obvious solution. Um, but I guess there's a few little um, problems of, you know, like usually it's a square object hidden inside a round ball or um, I guess I'm happy to go through the teething problems of ha having simple technology and then kind of upscaling over time. But I think it's an important addition to be able to actually test muscle strength. And I think IoT would be a perfect solution. Thank you so much. And if you didn't catch that, that was rehabilitation for brain injury patients through different realities, augmented virtual realities. That's, that is so cool. Uh, we might have to get you to speak next time. Um, if there's no one else, I'll give you another chance. But um, seeing as we're kind of space themed tonight as well, I did want to mention that we're right next door to the Australian Space Agency, which is pretty cool. Um, and also co-located with a cool cyber thing. Does anyone know what the cyber thing is here? Australian cyber, A3C. So they're also here in the building as well, which is fun. Um, I don't have any project to share, but I've been getting around podcasts lately, like specifically tech podcasts and Darknet Diaries is what I'm going through at the moment. Have any of you guys listened to that one? It's like a cyber focus, tells you how like you can sort of be safe online um, and tell others. So I've been telling 
you know, my parents, my friends and everyone, all the tips I've got from that. So that's a cyber theme thing. Um, anyone else in the room? Otherwise, we'll hand back over to developer Steve. And I think there was a couple of people on the chat who actually wanted to share a project. So we'll turn off mute, go, off, go on mute, yeah, and let someone else come off mute on the chat online. Thank you. Yay, thanks, Michelle, um, and amazing project. Uh, just for that pressurable one, I too was also thinking, hmm, how would I do that? But Jonathan Oxer has uh, put uh, an idea in the chat. Uh, he says, atmospheric pressure sensor inside the ball um, and a BME 280 will do it. So there we go, worth looking at. Um, and yeah, if, uh, as Michelle said, if you are looking, if you do build that out, we would love for you to come talk about it. <laughs> um, or anyone else for that matter, if you are looking to do a talk. But I'm about to bring uh, 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 someone that actually spoke here last year uh, at our meetup. Um, so Christopher Up from Briz, uh, Briz IoT, if you haven't uh, checked them out, I think they're online, but I'll get him to tell you all about it um, and also talk of uh, all the amazing projects he does. All right, got you. There we go. All right, Christopher, you should be able to put your camera mic on now. I hope. And then we've got two more that are going to come up quickly. Um, hey, there he is. Hello. Welcome back. G'day. Oh, good to be here. Um, yeah, so I'm Christopher. I'm the, the host of, of Brisbane IoT. Uh, we, we do not currently do uh, the usual evening meetup. They've been in, in hiatus for a year now. And every month my venue tells me, oh, yeah, we still can't resume. Sorry. So we still haven't resumed. But we are doing Sunday afternoon events, uh, usually with about a dozen people. We call that Sunday Mad Science. Um, and it's basically bring your problem along to a lab and uh, and talk it through with people. And, and those have been very popular on a smaller scale. The the project that we, uh, we've been looking at there is, uh, again, it's a crowdsourced weather project. And this one's about hail. Uh, I don't know what it's like in Adelaide, but in Brisbane, the hailstorms can get rather adventurous. And you know, everyone rushes out to try and get their car under cover if there's uh, reports of potential hail. But wouldn't it be nice to know um, that there's, a, there's actual hail in your area? And so this project uses LoRaWAN for its communications um, and solar powered. But we attach an accelerometer to, this, accelerometer to the solar panel so that we can detect hail impacts. And that doesn't help you that it's hailing, but if, if we have one or two in every suburb, then the fact that it's hailing in the next suburb gives you that two minutes warning you might need to go and throw a blanket over your car or uh, try and find a freeway overpass. And we bundle on all the other typical kind of weather sensors as well. Uh, we're at the point of um, putting together a, a first order of circuit boards to try and get some of these out into the uh, into the, into the neighbourhoods, um, and we're lucky enough in Brisbane that the City Council has, has got a, a LoRaWAN network which doesn't cover the whole city, but it covers m much of it. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much what I have to say about that. Um, I'm not sure questions. Um, we're in Brisbane. Our second Sunday of every month is our Sunday Mad Science, and yes, we will hopefully uh, resume evening meetings as soon as we can. Amazing, thank you. And yeah, I'm a big fan of um, the Briz IoT group too. So if you can, please check that out. Um, and subscribe to the page. Um, we'll talk anyway, because we, uh, we might be able to do a, a hybrid thing too, which we've now learned a whole bunch of, I don't know if anyone's noticed tonight, but we've learned a whole bunch of stuff on the fly that usually happens when you deploy to production. <laughs> oh, thank you, Chris. Um, amazing to hear from you again. Is there was one other person, there's, there was two people that wanted to come up and chat. Uh, so if you can put your hand up. Um, wait, I think let's bring you up as well. There we go. So you should get a prompt to come up and then you can just put your camera and mic on. Uh, is it um, Abhishek? I think you are wanting to come up and say hi maybe or not 
Okay, cool. Well, if anyone uh, wants to come up on the online version, uh, now's the time to do it. Um, but we'll have some time to uh, geek out on tables once we go back to networking. Space tables even, we're in space today. Um, you might notice I'm in Mars at the moment. Um, so if there's no one else, I'll pass back to Michelle and yeah, we um, uh, uh, wrap up if there's no one else. Oh, Ellie's come back. Hi, Ellie. <laughs> Hi, I just wanted to share a story. No, I didn't. I didn't. Um, Abby wasn't able to connect. And now, sorry if I'm um, mangling that name as well. My apologies. I liked, I'm i Australian and I uh, shorten everything. So maybe try, try that again, um, if, if you will. Can you connect? Um, oh, you can't connect as a speaker on mobile. My bad. Um, Anyway, I, while I'm here, though, I wanted to give a ma massive congratulations to Steve and Michelle. What an amazing um, live hybrid um, fusion you guys have done here. Really well done. Um, and I love that you're checking the satellites out there in space, Steve. Um, hope they're all operating correctly. And, yeah. Steve, you're waiting me for me to say something. All right. <laughs> okay. So that's probably all we have time for in terms of the speakers, letting you know about events, sharing a project. Um, and the rest of the night, we'll go into some networking, the fun stuff. So we'll probably uh, separate now from the hybridness to be just in person and you guys just online. Um, and if I will, I'll probably go off mute and deal with you guys. We can network together <laughs> and keep going to the bar. And developer Steve, I'll let you explain how to network in the Remo session. We'll close the speaker bit and you guys can go around on your tables. Um, but thanks again. And uh, yeah, hey, we'll Mich leave, sign off. Hey, Mich yeah. Michelle. Michelle. I, I have an IOT joke for I, you. I have I an IOT joke for you. I, I, don't want, you. I don't want the prize. I just want to tell you the joke. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Um, the oh, yeah. Not um, that I the lags are anyway, putting that I can um, myself. But anyway, one of the thing I love most about IoT is it's more than than just a little board. And board, board. Anyway, you get it. Anyway, thank you all for coming. That was an amazing meetup. I can feel the face palms already. Um, and yeah, I will. We'll see you next month. <laughs>